Scorpion's revenge was the most disappointing thing since my son. Battle of the Realms is an absolute dumpster fire. An ice storm. An uncontrollable ice storm. Nothing you can do to stop him. Mortal Kombat Legends Snowblind is the third movie in the Legends franchise. Directed by Rick Morales, the producer of the previous two movies. I hadn't directed, I've been producing for a while. I wanted to flex that muscle again, but also I just really liked this story. How it was a smaller, personal, reflective type of thing. And so I'm like, I'm doing this one. <laughs> Sorry, Ethan. <laughs> and written by Jeremy Adams, the writer of the previous two movies. My brain operates like Mortal Kombat is. It's monsters and sorcerers and cyborgs and ninjas and stuff. So I think from my point of view, it becomes very natural. This one is more of a very clear distillation of my love of martial art movies in a way. Whether it's like Blind Fury with Rudger Hauer or like the Mad Max Ooh. element of it. The higher-ups at Warner Bros. Entertainment saw the success of the last two movies, and they wanted more. Another! But this time, they wanted to take the movie into a direction the MK franchise has never gone before. I just appreciate how they tried a very new idea that hadn't been done before. It could be very likely that the reason they're doing this at all is because they've gotten negative feedback every time they try to adapt the games. So like, f*** it, we're doing an entirely brand new story, so nobody can get mad at us for inaccuracies because f*** you, it's a new story. Hard to say because the first one was so well received, so but maybe yeah, the opinion of the second one was why they did it. Hard to say. It was well received until you f***ers made videos tearing it apart. You couldn't just like a good thing. Then they overcorrected for deserved. Battle of the Realms. <laughs> I deserve. Will this movie open my third eye? Or will it leave me wanting to be blind? Let's find out. In Mortal Kombat Legends Snow Blind. Oh, and before we start, I have a sponsorship. Me. To celebrate the three year anniversary of my first sucks video, I'm selling t-shirts. KK in a wheelchair on a t-shirt. The poker skid drawn in a JoJo comic style. Reptile T posing. I designed these with a black background in mind. But there are multiple color options on the site. If you're interested or want to support the channel, then check out the merch link below. Sponsor over. We start the movie in a little town. Wait a minute. That's not the beginning of the movie. Run that back. We start the movie with a Warner Brothers logo. Oh, ruined. It's already ruined. Where's my Daffy Duck being killed by Scorpion or Scorpion being taken by Ultra Instinct Shaggy? Ruined. How can you not use this to promote a multiverses by having like another character like, like Gandalf blasting Raven or something? We see a memorial of Liu Kang in the village, probably for his contributions to saving the world in the previous film. Then they get ambushed by the Black Dragon, Ferator. Cabal, Aaron Black. Wait a minute. Run that back. Move in. Stop. Look at that roadhog ass. Damn boy, he fit! Kira. Oh gosh, so I'm worried about this. I'm worried that I'm gonna like love Kira because I have a fascination with toxic women in fighting games and they made her like super dangerous and femme fatale in this. <laughs> oh yeah, cause you, you love Jury, don't you? I love Jury, I love Melina, I love Anna. Cobra, and finally, Everyone's favorite. Who? No face. Why does he have a face? By the way, you see this meme of reptile? There's actually an interesting story behind it. Last year, during my This Isn't The Real Reptile rant, I brought up my prediction of what reptile could look like in the Legend series. He'll have his lizard form body from Scorpion's Revenge, and he'll wear the classic Mortal Kombat ninja costume, plus his MKX mask. Then I commissioned a fan art of this version of Reptile doing the Jacko pose. Well, recently, I realized this is the only art of this version of Reptile I have. So, I thought I'd cook up something interesting. 
Here is a reference sheet of my original reptile design. It's easily recognizable as reptile, but it's also an original design. And for those who need references to his body, I got you covered too. Here is a completely safe for work model. It's only used for references. Get your mind out of the gutter. I'll probably commission more stuff with this version of reptile in the future. And you are all welcome to use this character for fan arts too. Anyways enough simping for reptile. Back to the video. After the battle, Shang Tsung appears. So, this is Kung Lao. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Shang, Tsung. Shang Tsung. Boy, if I got that wrong. <laughs> you did? The Black Dragon are here to protect you, to keep you safe. <laughs> the Black Dragon are here to protect you. And this is where we get introduced to King Kano. Does Kano actually die when he gets the hammer thing to his eye? Yeah, you said it yourself. No one actually dies. <laughs> hey. <laughs> you better chop off their head and burn their body to make sure they're yeah. dead. And even you, then. <laughs> yeah, even then. You don't know. Definitely a more interesting villain in the franchise. And I'll explain more as we go along. How would you all like a little story? I like how he's giving us a plot dump. He's giving us actual lore so we're not confused. <laughs> the worldview in this movie is apparently Revenants came out of nowhere and turned Earth into a post-apocalyptic wasteland. I guess this is what Kitana meant by their oh, armies full, full strength. strength. And then the Black Dragon came along and took over the world. We then cut to Sub-Zero running away from a blizzard that turns out to be his brother. <laughs> Huai Liang wakes up from this nightmare. Ooh. <laughs> Q.I. <laughs> <laughs> Liang tends to his little Thanos farm and heads off to somewhere with his crop. Then suddenly, he gets ambushed by the Black Dragon. Yeah, good luck, yes, Sub Zero. You're totally gonna outrun this motorized vehicle with your mule. <laughs> just, just ice up the road and slide along it. You'll be faster. He could have done the ice behind him, like Mario Kart. He could have like just thrown the ice, like a banana peel, but it's his ice. Hey, get him, Queen. <laughs> They start asking him questions. Where'd you get that, huh? Just tell us where you got the food. They get pissed, beat him up. My cabbages! And leave. Cabal suspects that the old man was heading somewhere, and that's when they find another town. The three of them consider taking over this place without King Kano breathing down their necks. And just as they are talking about this, a new challenger shows up. Nightwing, I mean. Kenshi Takahashi. Cobra strikes first, and Kenshi does a three frame kick. I think Kenshi deserves S tier 100%. Kira goes next. Oh! Just slap the bitch. <laughs> Damn. You just slapped her, huh? Keep my wife's name. And finally, Cabal. But now he loses because Cabal literally has a cheat code. Which, for some reason, he doesn't use his speed abilities. Does Cabal have his speed powers, or did he just decide not to use them? I know, that was my thing. Yeah, yeah. One kiss is all it takes. <laughs> Kenshi defeats them, and they retreat. Do you know what you've done? Those are members of the Black Dragon. They're gonna come back, and this time, none of us will be safe. Come back? Huh. Maybe I'll stick around after all. <laughs> Who's the villain in this story? Then we head to K-Town. <laughs> Wait, no, seriously, what's your actual name? k none of your f***ing business. Where we see two people fighting in a cage. You know, this place looks kinda familiar. Perhaps it's the Black Dragon Fight Club from MK11. But the throne on the top reminds me of something else. Anyways, one of the fighters is defeated, and King Kano wants her dead. The winner refuses, and so he kills her. The loser thanks him, and then he kills her too. But... <laughs> it's so dark. <laughs> anyway, look at this, look at this. It's horrible. It's ho Why are you laughing? I quite like this scene. It shows just how unpredictable, brutal, and evil Kano is. And all this just for a bit of fun. Well, that was fun. Fun fact. The guy who got his face splattered with blood was no face. Why does he have a face? The trio come back, and King Kano assigns Tremor to go help them take on Kenshi. We then head to reference land. Remember this? I clap! Remember that? Clap! Clap! Remember that?
King Kano shows up, and wants Shang Tsung to spy on the trio in case of their betrayal. I will do what your king asks. This is going in your butt, Shang Tsung, if you talk back to me again. If I find you in here, in my kink dungeon, this is going right up your butthole. <laughs> we cut to Qi Liang in his nightmares again, then waking up and starting his day on his Thanos farm again. He is a creature of routine. But also we want to reuse the animations. I was gonna say. Qi Liang makes it to the town and is greeted by... Yo, is that art? <laughs> Hot lean. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies. <laughs> Come on, Kenshi. You've got game. Maybe he'll have better game when he loses his eyeballs. Yeah. <laughs> Kenshi finds out the old man is Lin Kui and wants him to train him. They get interrupted by the black dragon. Kui tries to calm the situation. Calm the heck down. <laughs> Here, Kui. Let me help. Thanks, Art. Thanks, Art. <laughs> just, he's just Art lean now. Then Kenshi and Trema fight, and it's pretty sweet. Enough! Trema destroys Kenshi, and I really like seeing him get beat up. Kenshi has been nothing but an arrogant brat, so I like seeing him get humbled. He's like, oh fuck, I wasn't born with some supernatural ability, get fucked. Yeah, get fucked. I appreciate the cocky bratty kid getting beat the shit out of him. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do when you're like, I've spent my life becoming this great martial artist and somebody comes in with powers, you know? It just like ruins oh, yeah. your day. And just as Kenshi is about to get stomped, Shang Tsung stops him because he overheard his name. If you want Kenshi Takahashi to apologize, you'll have to make me Takahashi. So Trema lets him live, and uses Kenshi as a warning. <sighs> he, he got that invincible face. <laughs> Shan Tsung helps out Kenshi. Well, Song helps out Kenshi. My name is Song. Song speaks of a legendary sword that could help Kenshi, and Kenshi wants it, because he wants to be the very best. So I am now going to do something interesting, and show a deleted scene here, because I personally think it adds more to the movie. We cut to Qi Liang's Thanos farm, as he wakes up from a nightmare naked again, because he hears the revenants. Then Qi Liang finds out his farm animals got killed. We then cut to Kenshi and Song on their journey. Song reminisces the past. It wasn't always this way. The desert, I mean. Once there were trees. And green grass. I've heard stories. The time before the revenant. He then talks about how he used to be a great warrior. Believe it or not, I was once a great warrior. Yeah? What happened? I... I don't know. Age, I suppose. It's hard to remember before this. Before Kano. You could chalk this up to Song just being old, but I personally think there is more to it. Song talks about the ruthlessness of King Kano, and hopes for Kenshi to defeat him. Then they get ambushed by Revenants. It's a cool fight. I think, they then continue on their journey. I mainly appreciate this deleted scene because we actually get to see the threat of the Revenants in the Wasteland. Whereas in the movie, we only hear about them. The Revenants kept coming. And see them in flashbacks. They then reach their destination and enter a cave. They then see some words. These markings, this language. It's Chinese. <laughs> Blood magic. Oh, we need KK here. <laughs> we need Scarlet. We need Atara. Natara is in universe, so she can show up. <laughs> I think you're slicing her. Oh. <laughs> Not that Natara. That would have been pretty funny, Sonic, if like he goes, blood magic. I know somebody. She was like, yeah, yeah. And like a really old, like, haggity version of Scarlet just wobbles into flame. Yeah, fuck you, Shang Tsung. I'll open the fucking well. And she's like, uses her magic. <laughs> Kodo, Kodo shows up on the wheelchair. Right, there we go. It's a Kodo wheelchair reference. Kenshi opens the well, gets blasted by green goo, and is now blinded. Kenshi isn't dead, just blinded. Shang Tsung reveals himself. The souls are mine. Ah, I'll say it. He said the line. He said the line. He said it. He said the thing. Member berries. He said the thing. Uh, 
Is that the thing? Let's do the, uh, what's the meme? Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio meme, huh? What shall I do with you? S just suck him to death. Suck him dry. Oh no, soul suck. Okay. What do you mean, okay? <laughs> no, I meant like, Kenshi says, I want to die, and, Sh and Shane said, okay. Oh, I thought you were saying, okay, to suck him dry. <laughs> no, I saw him. I was reporting you guys. I was, watching, I was actually watching the movie. <laughs> no, Kenshi, I won't kill you. I give you a fate worse than death. <laughs> no, Shane says, <laughs> stop. Kenshi gets tossed into the well and left for dead. Then he hears a faint sound. He takes the sword Sento, and roams around the desert, until he faints from exhaustion, in front of some gold loot. So something I'd like to compliment about this movie, is the fact that up to this point, this is all quite faithful to Kenshi's lore in the games, from being a prideful warrior looking for challenge, to Shang Tsung's fake name song and pretty much everything in the cave was accurate to the source material. Kenshi's story is different in the sense that it's set in a different place within the timeline, but it's very much the storyline from the game. Despite the movie being a very original story in the MK franchise, I do find it very commendable that the creators put in a very accurate depiction of Kenshi's origins into a very different MK world. Kenshi's never even interacted with Shang Tsung canonically. Oh my god. This film has a first, a canonical, technically, by virtue of being canonical to this continuity, encounter between Kenshi and Shang Tsung. That's crazy. The next day passes, and we see... Ah! Let's go! Hey. We keep getting shots! Let's go! It's the third time! More material, baby! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Liang finds Kenshi. Despite the fact that he was much farther from where he fell, we then cut to K-Town. <laughs> As we see them using a dude for target practice, and just as he's about to get killed. Oh! Fun fact, during this fight, this guy actually survives the whole thing. How dare you! Cabal fans are crying right now because he never got to use his Literally. super speed. King Kano then says something quite peculiar. You know, I've been wondering where you got off to. I went off to find a way to put you back in your place. You found the Well of Souls then? <laughs> Surprised? Come now. Why do you think I sent you to the outpost? You've done this dance before, but I thought this time, this time you might give me just a little bit of a challenge. The fact that he knew Shang Tsung was going to the Well of Souls, and the fact that he let him go, is already indication that this Kano is more sophisticated than we think. He's made us something. Something bad. Something powerful. You'd be wise to remember that. They continue their fight. So the question is, which Black Dragon is going to job here? Come on. Who's going to die? Probably Cobra. Oh! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> it's him. Yep, you're right, Snake. Already out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Cobra fans, you poor, poor, innocent souls. I mourn for the dozen of you. What's very funny is I predicted it with the other guys about this, that he would have died even before the end of the movie. Interestingly, Cobra's not here, at least in this shot. So I, maybe noticed he'll that, die I noticed that, I noticed that too. King Kano shoots three times. Then we see two bullets yeah. flying towards Shai. And then the bullets multiply by a hundred. Aaron Black and Cassie Cage are jealous. Kira, is Kira okay? Okay, Kira's still alive. Queen's still fine, yeah, Queen's still Queen's fine. Queen's still fine, good. For now. She has to live long enough for all the Rule 34 art. Then Shang Tsung gives the king a soul suck. Your soul. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, he's oh, in the line. Oh. He's in the thing. He's in the thing. Remember berries. But sadly, Kano has no soul. At first, I thought this might be related to the twist that happens later on. But I think it's just the fact that Kano is cybernized, and cyborgs in the MK law have no souls. I remember watching Shang trying to take Kano's soul, and saying, oh, I, what was it, I sold my soul a long time ago or something? I'm way past having a soul. In my head, I'm like, that's not how it works. And then later you show us that he's fully cyberized, and I remembered that Sector, Cyrax pretty much lost their souls, Smoke too, without uh, Sub-Zero's help getting it back. And I was like, 
He did his homework. He really knows. So Shang Tsung is just a dumbass who didn't study enough MK law. You're the same <laughs> manipulating, sniveling sorcerer that underestimates those around him. Right? Thank you King for agreeing with me. And then King Kano demolishes Shang Tsung and kills him. Now there is a lot to unpack here. First off, justice for Striker. We thank our Giga Chad King for avenging our fallen bro. Actually, I find it quite poetic that King Kano pulled Shang's head off, because that's what Shang made Striker do. Second, this is probably the most gruesome bloody kill in the whole entire Legend series. I have to double up the KK in a wheelchair sensor bars just to show what's on screen, and I love it. Third, King Kano's speech to Shang Tsung is really cryptic. I keep hoping that you'd do something different. I figured, if someone was gonna give me a challenge, it'd be you. And nope. Are you here again? I made this world. And I'll make it again and again and again. Better luck next time. I was genuinely confused the first time I watched this, and very intrigued to see where things go. He just said, like, we've done this over and over again yeah. or something. I do wonder... Yeah, where is this going? And finally, the death of Shang Tsung. The first controversial point in this movie. It would be so fucking funny if Shang Tsung jobs to Kano. <laughs> that would be so fucking funny if he's actually that tough. Dude, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I personally see this as a double-edged sword. On one hand, there were people who theorized that Shang Tsung was going to be the actual big bad, and Kano is just a front. I can guarantee you Kano's not actually gonna be like, an opponent you fight. He seems more like the Kingpin character. Like he's almost like really? a figurehead. I wouldn't be surprised if Shang Tsung lets him think he's the leader, but in the background Shang Tsung's doing all the stuff. Like, I think that's gonna be the actual reveal. Like, he's gonna start off as like a henchman, and then it's gonna be revealed that he was the one doing everything, and he allowed Kano to believe that he was the guy in charge the whole time. That's what I think it's gonna be. But as it turns out, this was a twist within a twist. A donut hole in a donut's hole. And the creators definitely did this intentionally. Kano generally works for Shang Tsung, so that made it interesting. You take this guy who's usually the second fiddle and you make him the guy. I knew Shang Tsung was going to power. It's like, of course he is. He's Shang Tsung. That's what's going to happen. And at that point in the movie, you don't know that Kano is as strong as he is. Like, like this is this is not Kano. Kano is not strong. <laughs> so when Kano kills him, you're like, as an audience member going, what the hell is going on? Like, that's what you want to feel. Like, what is happening? Shang Tsung is like, you think it's him. You think that's the guy. That's the bad guy. He's always the bad guy. And then suddenly it's King Kano and you're like, what is going on? Oh yeah. And yeah. it was an indication of the audience to be like, I don't know what's happening right now. Right. You know, even fans of Mortal Kombat are not entirely sure what's, what is happening. This isn't the way it's supposed to be necessarily. <laughs> and hopefully we answer that to a satisfaction by the end of it. Another thing to note is how do you make King Kano into a threatening villain? Well, how about having him kill off everyone's beloved MK1 final boss Shant Sung? That'll establish King Kano being a true menace for our protagonists. But now let's look at the other side. Kano, the biggest loser jobber throughout the series, has killed off everyone's beloved MK1 final boss. Why don't they even bother bringing Shang back then? And another thing, we now can't have Kenshi's arc with Shan Tsung. I just complimented how accurate they do Kenshi's origins. Yet the final piece of the puzzle, Shan Tsung, ain't gonna be there. In fact, Kenshi completely forgets about Shang Tsung throughout the movie. I will teach you to use your senses. So I can find Shang Tsung. No. This is definitely an aspect I'm disappointed with, but I can't see why they did it. It's to establish the threat of King Kano. There were two choices in this situation. One, have Shang Tsung win, or survive, and have him play a part later on in the story. Two, have King Kano win, and have King Kano be the main focus. Considering the events that happened later on, it's quite obvious why the latter was chosen. Do I wish for Shang Tsung to survive and have him fight Kenshi? Yes, but I can see why they did it. Each choice has their advantages and disadvantages. Next we see Kenshi waking up in a cabin. He is taken in by Qi Liang, because he doesn't want Kenshi's body to attract the revenants. Kenshi doesn't want to be a burden, so he leaves. <laughs> 
Poor baby. If you're going to kill yourself, be quick about it, so I can bury you before the sun rises. Oh oh Huai Liang reluctantly decides to teach him how to fight, so he can survive in the wilderness. A fine scene overall. For establishing their relationship, the only thing that irks me was Kenshi trying to backstab Qi. Sub Zero is like, hey, if you're gonna kill yourself, make it quick. Yeah. And Kenshi's immediate reaction is, well, fuck you, I'm gonna try and murder you with a sword. Man who just saved my life. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what a dick. That's our hero. He just yeah. tried to murder an old man who saved his life. Kill yourself. The next day, Huai Liang slaps Kenshi for ah! slapping the Queen Kid. Listen. Hear the wind. Hear the corn stalks rustling. It's corn! Yes. Those don't matter. <laughs> Do you hear that? I mean, I'll give it props. Then we get the Rocky training montage. Later, Kenshi explains how his powers work. When I hold it, I can see. It's like when you stare at a flame and then you look away, you see the light of the flame even though it's gone. Then Kenshi faints, cause Qi Liang put sleeping elixir in his soup. I think it's the train his sense of smell. You should have used your nose. We cut to Qi Liang running in his nightmare again, but this time, he faces the truth. No! Brother, no! I am not your brother. I. Am. You. No! Yes. Then he wakes up and... Here we go, fourth time, fan service! Good. You're up. My eyes! Come with me. In the next training montage, Qi Liang wants Kenshi to slice the melons before it falls onto his face. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I brought so many melons. <laughs> I didn't think I was like, he's literally playing Fruit Ninja. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Remember that game that used to come out on the iPhone? Yeah, 20 years ago, all the youngsters used to play that. That's what we're gonna do. Then they have a sparring match, and Kenshi still doubts himself. Once, I was a great warrior. Great warrior. Here we go again. Now I'm a blind man who chases chickens all day. And that is what you will always be. <laughs> Quietin's got some pretty sick burns in this movie. <laughs> I don't know, he may have ice powers, but he burns. He learned that from Scorpion. Kill yourself. You never think these things through. I know my own destiny, uncle. Is it your own destiny? Or is it a destiny someone else has tried to force on you? Stop it, uncle. I have to do this. I'm begging you. It's time for you to look inward and begin asking yourself the big questions. Who are you? And what do you want? Those don't matter. The only thing that matters is this chicken. <laughs> Pick up the piece of wood. Grab your wood, Kenshi. My brother made the same joke, Snake. <laughs> Pick up that wood and put it up. <laughs> Hear my feet. Smell my scent. Ew. Smell my scent. Doesn't this farmer smell worse than a bag of vinegar? <laughs> I didn't need to know that. He's like, yes, you do. <laughs> this is very important for your training. <laughs> so I do smell as bad. <laughs> then we get another Rocky montage, but this time with Kenshi succeeding. But also we want to reuse the animations. Later, Kenshi asks why Qi Liang doesn't use his ice abilities anymore. And Qi explains his backstory. A city was being attacked by revenants. And Sub-Zero leads the Lin Kui clan to stop them. However, the revenants full strength is proving to be too much for them. So in a desperate attempt, Sub-Zero unleashes an ice storm. Killing everyone, the revenants, his clan, innocent bystanders. And thus... Qi Liang swears never to use his powers again. If kneeling spares those around me, I'd live on my knees. It's not about what you can do, it's about what you can do and not do it. That's where Sub-Zero is right now. He knows what happens when he lets go. He's the ticking time bomb. Yeah. This is all pretty great character development for Qi Liang, but there is one line I do find weird. For a long time, I thought the worst thing that I could become 
was my brother. What? What, what do, do you, you mean? mean the worst thing you can become is your brother? Your brother was quite the honorable man in the first tournament. <laughs> huh? What gives? You dishonor this tournament. I knew I couldn't find any info about this in interviews or articles. So I instead did something special. I interviewed the writer of the movie himself, Jeremy Adams. Hello! Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, that's not entirely true. October 22, the Realm cast was going to interview Jeremy Adams. It was going to be live. The live performance! And the viewers can ask him questions. So I planned a dozen questions and got ready for the live stream. Hello. It's currently... 4.45 a.m. I got my hot cocoa, my bread, and I'm single and ready to mingle with Jeremy Adams. And that took me an hour for some reason. We're gonna be discussing No Blind, obviously, with Jeremy Adams. I take it everybody who will be joining has seen it and has questions. Sonic Ha, welcome, I see you there and I know you have questions you've got your list you mentioned <laughs> let's go ahead and welcome Jeremy oh, Adams. Hey! hey Jeremy how you doing is that an exciting enough uh, entrance scream the live stream was fantastic and I appreciate the realm cast and Jeremy Adams for doing this anyways here's my question very very good question here from Sonic XD. I, I like this one uh, Kwai Liang said I thought the worst thing that I could become was my brother could you elaborate on that since we've never really seen Bihan in this series Again, that was like me taking in so much of Mortal Kombat continuity and just how dark the brother could get. If we were going with game lore, the best I can think of is Bihan killing Hanzo Hasashi. And if we were looking at it in Scorpion's Revenge, he was on Shang Tsung's side in the tournament. Or perhaps he thought the Shirai Ryu massacre was done by Bihan. But Jeremy implied something else. I want to hint at a history that we haven't seen. I don't necessarily want to spell it out. I want people that are really knowledgeable of the characters to go, oh, you know, this character came back from the dead and was possessed, like all that stuff that happened and fill in some of that stuff. Some of it's best left unsaid because you want to draw your own conclusions. <laughs> did you did you just accidentally reveal Noob Saibot? So I think what Jeremy is implying is in between this movie and the last tournament, Noob Saibot happened. As cool as all this is, I think they should have explained Bihan a bit better in the story. Especially since Kenshi has no idea what he's talking about. In the next scene, we see Kenshi finally catching the chicken. Now clean it for supper. What? No. Not Simone. She named it? Then they see the town near them being attacked by the black dragon. Wait. The same town that Qi Liang rides a mule to every day? The one that the black dragon drove miles to get to, is right next to them. Ooh, that's kind of small. The black dragon have captured the outpost. Oh, a bit tricky, you lot. Trying to stay away from me and my black dragon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I know why you're laughing. <laughs> now I know why you're laughing. Try it. Oh my god. Disgusting. Disgusting! Then King Kano forces them to kneel. And all I ask is you kneel to honor the new king. <laughs> is not this simpler? Is this not your natural state? But one man doesn't kneel. Ooh. Oh, come on. Give me Loki vibes. And that man is... Wait. Isn't that Art Lean? The guy hanging out with Qi Liang from the beginning of the movie? They whitewashed him. Ooh. What the hell? Oh. Okay. Loki then kills him. Before he died, he still knelt. Is that the past that he knelt? I'm not too sure. <laughs> oh. oh gosh. I'm not laughing, Rick. That was you. Uh, I know. <laughs> Qi Liang is disgusted by what he saw, but due to his own principles, he decides to ignore them and leave. Kenshi, however, wants to help. There is nothing more poisonous than I can't. Come on now. You're the protagonist. You're were, you were supposed to be saying these sort of things. It's not the same. 
I can't. There is nothing more poisonous <laughs> than I can't. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. What do you mean you cannot? And thus, they start their conflict. Fine. Go. We don't have the budget to fight, just go. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know, we, yes, yes, we do! We <laughs> 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 Got a Neji palm there. Yes, that was only 16 palms. Got off easy. <laughs> we can avoid them. Live a good life. We can get married. We have children. <laughs> Before I lost my eyes, I would have said yes. <laughs> <laughs> that really doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> No. When I was a cocky bastard, I would have said, sure, let, let's go live a life of nothing. Yeah. Yeah, what they should have said is, before you helped me to control my powers, I would have said yes, because he's just a depressed yes. loser. Yeah, That's yeah. when he would have stayed. And then they go their separate ways. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. Congratulations! We have reached the third act of this movie. The fun part. This movie has just been a roller coaster ride slowly going up. And now, get ready for the drop. This is where the fun begins. Kenshi infiltrates King Kano's camp, as we see the happiest evil man start a fire. <laughs> I'm gonna set this fire up so- <laughs> Kenshi makes a grand entrance. Ah, oh, check out the balls on this blade. Ball. What the hell? Show off. Then King Kano calls out his most deadly warrior. Hey, Jarek. Jarek? Jarek. <laughs> Let's go, everyone's favorite. That. Don't you know he's a uh, very famous MK character, Jarek, from the from MK4? Guess he wasn't half the character he was. And now, a really, really fun fight commences. Pathetic. <laughs> I think Kira is still, I think she was ducking there and she still didn't die. She's fine, she's fine, she's fine. She, she yeah, went she's to the Yeah, she's still boxes. not dead. They're actively not killing Kira. All the no-name guys, he just immediately swings his sword and kills them. But someone like Kira, nah, he'll like bat her aside. Exactly, he like actively did not kill Kira. He respects the queen. He slapped her earlier. Dude, we can kill her father, but if it's a name character, we gotta give him more scenes. Too bad we can't say the same for, for Kira or whatever his name is. Kira? <laughs> you forgot his name. <laughs> Aaron Black, with his amazing weaponry skills, misses every shot, while a blind man kicks a car and hits him right in the face. <laughs> then Tremor joins the party, and they take the fight outside. Okay Aaron Black, Kenshi is standing still, all you've got to do, is shoot him. So I thought it'd be fun to do some simple mathematics. So in this scene, Aaron Black has missed 15 shots. And in the last scene, he missed 19 shots. So that is 34 shots missed. Now let's see how many shots he missed in Mortal Kombat Aftermath. 24 shots. So in conclusion, Aaron Black is improving. It's just backwards. You fear him. When he pops up and he cocks his pistol, like, it's bad. No, like, actually bad. Like, he's actually bad at what he does. This is the same guy who can toss coins and use them to ricochet bullets onto his opponents. Cutscene Aaron is a joke. Yeah! Also, fun fact, the bullet Kenshi slashes, which they proudly promote in the trailer, actually splits in half before the blade even hits it. Ooh, ooh. The fight goes on, and Kenshi starts to get tired. <laughs> After years of barely shooting anybody in cutscenes, he got a shot. He did it! He fucking did it! Kenshi takes too many blows and is defeated. King Kano doesn't want to kill him because he wants to learn more about him. Now that was... that was new. Unexpected. You know how rude it is? I think I'd like to know your story, boy. Take him with us to k -Town. I really can't get over that dumbass name. Take him with us to k <laughs> What's so uh, funny about- K-Town. <laughs> Silence! You know, while there were many members of the Black Dragon in this fight, I wonder where Ferator is when all this was happening. 
So, do you have one or two? Now that's a common misconception, and I'd consider that more... Oh, I just got a call that we gotta leave! Where do you think you're going in this hour, young lady? Um, K-Town? K-Town? That sounds like a K-pop band. Well, King Kano wanted us to go back for some sort of execution. King Kano? What happened to serving Quatelcon? Or Kitanacon, I, I don't know what this origin is. Well, that's because this is a different continuity, where Earthrealm is a wasteland and Kenshi is the main character. Kenshi Takahashi, the man who learned the telekinetic slam from Ermac. And we aren't in the movie. Do you remember the promise you made? I made a promise. The promise you made one year ago. Yeah, we can have our five second cameo and be killed off. Oh. I, I'm sorry. They, they said my character fits with the Mad Max theme of the movie. And, and that they're running out of characters to kill off. No, no, seriously. They, they actually said that. They actually said that behind the scenes. You know what, Ferritor? We're, we're proud of you. You finally got your cinematic debut. So just go. But. But. Just go. And don't turn back. <gasps> I'm sorry. Oh. Just go. In fact, all of you, get out of here. All right, get lost, all of you. You're fired. Go scram. Get out of here, you moochers. I just wanted to play some poker. That's right. Keep moving. You know what? Yeah. Except you. You stay. By the way, if you want to see 15 minutes of extra poker skit content. Hey, this is going pretty well. We might have a chance. <laughs> Then check out the Poker Skit compilation video where we did a Q&A session answering your funny questions and creepy ones. All right, now leave us alone. We're still brooding on Ferator. Huai Liang sees them taking Kenji away and decides to rescue him. He goes back to his Thanos farm grabs the kunai, and burns the farm, in order to summon someone. Why? He's gonna break his promise, he's gonna let go of his old life. He's gonna summon Scorpion. <laughs> We're literally thinking way too into it, he's just setting his farm on fire. Like, who's that? What? Is this done? Hey, hey, I'm here for my cameo in this installment, as everyone expected. Don't lie, you knew. Oh, I right? Oh my god, I was gonna say yes, yeah, Scorpion. No fucking yeah, way. What the he summoned him. <laughs> what the frick is this redesign? Oh my gosh. Look how demonic this guy looks. How did you get a project approved without Scorpion being the focus? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'll be honest, I'm only here after contractual obligation. First time it was a fun little gimmick giving me so much attention, but it's only gotten more and more contrived each time to the point that I've really got nothing to do this time. So, there's my cameo this time. I hope you enjoyed the writers derailing this entire production and foregoing an opportunity to give someone else the spotlight just to get me in here for the sake of... consistency, I guess? I mean, I guess it's somewhat laudable. Uh, MK could do with some consistency at this point. Bye. <laughs> what the fuck? And now, Fire and Ice are working together to go up against the Black Dragon. I like to mention their designs here. Scorpion. I have come. Looks so edgy, so spawn-like, that I kind of like it. Sub-Zero's armor is more rusty and worn out, and I personally really like broken armor designs. We head off to K-Town. Sam! What's it all this? I've had enough of this rowdy rebel sniggling behavior. To see Kenshi's execution. Look at Eren go. Look at his moves, it's like this guy is good at shooting or something. And just as Eren is about to finish off Kenshi, just like how it happens in MKX. When you have to shoot, shoot! An ice storm appears. An ice storm. An uncontrollable ice storm. You ask me who taught me to play- Sub-Zero shows up to fight. Where have you been hiding then, I am gonna freeze you from 0.0000000 degrees Celsius. And Scorpion saves Kenshi. And then we get the quickest, most bizarre cameo in cinema history. 
Was that Dairu? Yeah. <laughs> Dairu from all around tries to attack Scorpion. He's never shown in the Black Dragon group, and you never see him afterwards. He just shows up for literally one second, and leaves. His cameo was so short, that not even the writer of this movie knew about his existence. I'm just curious, everybody keeps mentioning Dairu. I remember Jarek. Am I misremembering? I remember Jarek. I don't remember the other one. But that might have been something that storyboard guys threw in. Just think about it. It's not like just like taking the character model and just slapping it in there. It's like they had to design a version of the character in this art style just for this one shot. Yeah. And that's it. Like, why? One, you, you could have just had like Pharaoh go flying through the earth and Tor throwing her. Or had like Cabal blaze in at super speed. My theory is that Dairu was supposed to be in the group but they didn't have enough space to shove him in. But unlike Jarek, where they just kill him off, I think they just forgot about him. But some random storyboard animator still really wanted to see him on the big screen. So instead of having Cabal ambush Scorpion, they changed it to Dairu. Mad respect for this random animator. If I were in their shoes, I'd probably do the same thing too. Kenshi joins the fight, and the queen protects the king. Kenshi struggles with Kira. Despite the fact that he defeated her easily early on. Kira, it is hilarious to me how good you are at not dying. You say that, but she's gonna die right now. Yeah, I know. But then he does the OB1 pose and strikes back. Don't fuck oh. with me, boy. I will rip you apart. So close. First time. First time. Sub Zero gets attacked by Tor, and Fera fucking stabs the shit out of him. Twenty-eight stab wounds. Fera also stopped him from using his ice abilities. This is the biggest W Fera Tor has ever gotten in this series. That's what I'm talking about. That's why he's the goat. The goat. And just as Eren is about to finish up sub -Zero, are we seriously fucking doing this again? Scorpion saves him, and then he gives us a super sick kill. Oh. <laughs> okay, that was kinda cool. <laughs> Congratulations Farah on your first death scene in the Mortal Kombat franchise. Then we get a Mexican standoff. You know what Eren, at this point. You might as well miss. He got him! It's bad. Then Scorpion says the line, in the sexiest way possible. Get over here. Oh. Then we get. But John is very stinky. I was like, Devor? Yeah. <laughs> and then we get an epic snow blind team up montage, all the way up to King Kano and the epic 3v1 fight begins. I especially love this part where they non-stop fight for around 10 seconds, and there's a lot of details to take in. Scorpion tries to grab his sword that he impaled into King Kano early on. He fails the first time, then succeeds later on. Sub-Zero freezes King Kano's head and arm, and the king just shrugs it off like it's nothing. Sub-Zero tries to ice beam him again, and fails 4 times. And Kenshi just uses the downward katana strike technique. Six times. Okay, I know, I know this makes it sound like it's bad, but putting it all together, it still makes for a banger 3v1 moment. Then Scorpion and Kenshi grab onto King Kano, and Sub Zero gives the finishing blow. Oh, <laughs> Cut the cord, or it's gonna come right back in. No one beats Kano. No one beats Kano! You're right! Damn it! <laughs> you predicted that just like my brother. Then he runs away. Yeah. Did he actually use super speed there? Oh, he finally used his- He did it! He finally used it! Oh my gosh, he finally used his speeding abilities. <laughs> he discovered it through the power of love. Honestly, if Cabal just never used his speed abilities, my only complaint would have been, I can't believe they nerfed him. But now that he used it in this scene, and only in this scene, my complaint has now turned into, why the fuck didn't Cabal use it throughout the movie? 
there were many fights where it could have benefited him. They did a better job showcasing this for the funny soul suck guy in the 2021 movie. How dare you! And the trio chase after them. So two more complaints I have about this snow fight. 1. The blizzard was cool and all, but it did get in the way of looking at the fight. It did make it feel a bit messy sometimes. 2. Sub-Zero's powers are really unbalanced. Sometimes, he can only shoot ice beams, and he takes too long to use his abilities. And then other times, he can just whip out a massive AoE, and take out a dozen people. There's this one move, where he shoots out a gust of wind, and within a second, it kills 4 people. But overall, this was still a super fun fight. Lots of fan service. Lots of gore. Why are you walking? Why are you walking? The trio catch up, and... Did his arms grow yeah. Mr. Fantastic here shows up. I freaking love the sound effect it makes. Kenshi decides to take on Tremor, while the rest chase after King Kono. Kenshi does pretty good against Tremor, but then Tremor starts stomping, and they get into a staged transition. Cabal ambushes Sub and Dom, and Scorpion teleports Sub Zero, while he gets brutally impaled by Cabal. Kenshi and Tremor continue their fight, and things aren't looking good for Kenshi. As Tremor throws away his sword, Tremor grabs Kenshi with his magma rock hands, and Kenshi somehow survives being grabbed for 12 seconds, and just as Kenshi is about to be burnt to a crisp, 12 seconds late, he channels his arcana, puts two fingers onto Tremor's over 1000 degree Fahrenheit magma rock hand, and breaks it. Well that's... That's insane. Mr. Kenshi, if you're strong enough to kick and break magma rock needles, then why were you even trapped by rocks the first time you fought Tremor? Then Kenshi lines up the perfect angle for his sword to penetrate Tremor. You know Kenshi, Tremor let you live the first time you guys fought. Maybe you can offer him mercy. I am no Jedi. Treasure! And Kenshi Takahashi. And it's fine, ain't I? We cut to Scorpion bleeding out so much blood that Scholard feels jealous. And then Scorpion uses Ghost Riders level 3 and burns the burn victim to death. Again. You see, guys, the reason Scorpion can burn Cabal with fire and Tremor couldn't burn Kenshi with lava is because. Um. It's blinding it's time. Blinding time. Sub-Zero continues to chase King Kano, and now we've reached the apex point. We have just lost cabin pressure. Everything you thought you knew about this movie is about to change. He's made us something. Something bad. Something powerful. I made this world. And I'll make it again and again and again. Oh, you mean, no, they're not gonna do Kronka. Oh! Oh my gosh, no way! Um, oh so my god! What did I say? Oh, I can't believe this! See, see, he's still got the hood with the skull, so it really is going full Grim Reaper. He's got Kronika's crown? Yeah, I was gonna say, what? So he got the crown and, like, rewrote reality so that he's the top dog? That would be interesting, I would actually so like MK11 that. happened. I would actually. That's the twist. I would enjoy that stupid retcon. It's yeah. fucking MK11. Yes. It's a <laughs> Straight up. This is this is a sequel to Kano's MK11 ending, basically. <laughs> this, this. I have been expecting you. Your life, your name. They will be wiped from history. Come, it is time to die. King Kano grabs Kronika's crown from the desk. You'd think you'd put something as important as the crown that controls time somewhere more secure, and not somewhere inches away from Shang Tsung's reach. Although, it isn't used for godlike powers in this movie, it's used to open a door. Sub Zero enters the room and sees Kronika Sourglass, showcasing his MK11 arcade ending. The events of MK11. First official appearance of Cassie Cage in a Mortal Kombat motion picture. And most importantly, Kano's MK11 arcade ending. 
the origins of how this whole entire movie happened. King Kano explains that he used the hourglass to rewrite history into his own playground, creating the revenants, and turning the world into a horrible state. Now, there's a bit of a contradiction in this. Don't you need Chronicus crown to restart history? In defeating Chronica, you destroyed her crown. Without it, you can't restart history. Well, I actually have a simple explanation for this. This movie was probably made before the release of Mortal Kombat Aftermath, where they established the rule about Chronicus crown. In the MK11 arcade endings, the characters are depicted using the hourglass without the crown, so it was canon that you can use the hourglass without the crown before Aftermath was released, and that was the law the creators used in this movie. Now that Sub-Zero knows the truth, he must stop King Kano. Now I'd like to take a big fat pause, because we have a fat ton of stuff to go over. I guess I'll start by addressing the elephant in the room. The hourglass twist is probably the biggest controversial point in this movie. Some people like it, and think it expands the world view, while others think it's unnecessary, and would like the movie without it more. Now you know me. I'm the guy who hates and trashes on the ending of the Legends movies. So what did I think about the twist? After contemplating about this for around 3 months, I must say. I liked it. <laughs> And I'm going to explain why I think this twist vastly improves this movie. From the biggest Legends hater, to now the biggest Legends defender. Oh, it all makes sense now, brother. I really like the foreshadowing of this twist. Throughout the movie, you get glimpses of something bigger going on behind the scenes. Something not right. And the biggest giveaway about this twist, was the fact that Chronicus crown design was on the door this whole time. This movie has been a very simple premise, so simple in fact, that it becomes very predictable. He could have done the ice behind him, like Mario Kart. He could have like just thrown the ice, like a banana peel, but it's his ice, it would have worked. Well, why isn't he using his ice then? Mm -hmm. Oh god, are they gonna do an old man Logan where he like refuses to use it because it fucks yes. the world over? Yes. Huh, what's the play here? Why is he not killing him? Can Shang Tsung see the future? Well... Well, he, he does, he recognizes him already, so I assume it's like, I know who that is, I, I need to get those souls to become young again. Oh, So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna right. be his friend. He uses Kenshi, you're right, totally does. I'm very smart. But when the hourglass showed up, we were all flawed, despite the fact that they threw very obvious hints right towards our faces. I like the glass onion, as a metaphor, an object that seems densely layered, but in reality, the center is in plain sight. Though I will say, just because a twist is unexpected, doesn't mean it's good. But I do think this twist is justified, because... There are many questions and issues I have with the setting this movie takes place in. A Mad Max wasteland with zombies? This thing better not go straight to video! But the moment you show the hourglass, everything gets cleared up. And you're like, oh, you know, there's there's kind of that little hint of, of mystery and it's like, that's what they've done. I have heard people saying like, oh snap, that makes sense now. The MacGuffin that made them go, oh, now I kind of understand how this could have happened. We all agree the ending twist was like actually kind of a reverse plot hole where it made sense and fixed some of the issues. And speaking of stuff it fixes. Throughout my watch party with True Underdog and the Fourth Snake, these two could not shut up about how stupid it was that Kano was so OP. It would be so fucking funny if Shang Tsung jobs to Kano. <laughs> that would be so fucking funny if he's actually that tough. Because I think it's hilarious. I feel like your brother did. We're like, you're like, yeah, Devorah wins, hooray. I feel like, yeah, fucking Kano, for some stupid reason, is like god tier powerful, and that's hilarious. Yeah, it's, it's so wild that Kano is beating Scorpion, Sub Zero, and Kenshi. I was once the most powerful force in the realms before Kano. <laughs> <laughs> I was the top guy until Kano came along. Fucking Chad Kano. How embarrassing. But after the twist. They definitely had a change of heart about Kano. That ending, that the, the reveal with the MK11 Kano ending, it kind of does justify a lot of the dumb shit or, and like redeem some of it. Even though it might bother some people, this explains this so much better than him just being like a cyborg Lin Kuei or something. This makes more sense. He's like made himself unkillable on his own timeline. Making Kano the main villain 
especially in something that doesn't involve this special forces the character who actually connected to him is kind of dumb but mm -hmm. the way they went about it is, is pretty good another great thing about this twist is how it elevates king Kano's character king Kano is a brutal evil and threatening villain but after the hourglass twist he becomes an engrossing psychopath there's a very interesting character tray about King Kano that people wouldn't get unless they played through his MK11 arcade ending. Sure, the hourglass gave King Kano immense powers, but why not use it to become a god? I am a god! Why not use it to predict every outcome and guarantee a 100% victory? And the reason for that is because he's already done it. I set it up so that everything came up aces. Every desire, every wish, every whim I ever had, done and done. But then Kano realizes, this isn't what he really wants. But I realized pretty quick I'd suck the fun out of things. Without a fight, winning was worthless. Nah, the fun wasn't in the having. It was in the getting. So Kano does not want the ultimate treasure. He wants the journey towards that treasure. He wants the thrill of working towards that success. Now what I want is always just out of reach. I gotta earn it. I score lots of wins, but not always. And when I do win, <laughs> it's something to say. He doesn't want to play Minecraft in creative mode. He wants to play it in hardcore. King Kano has resetted the universe over and over again just so he can have fun fighting and killing legendary warriors over and over again. And by the time we see him in this movie, he's already bored of this. But to be honest, it was all getting a bit boring, you know? So imagine his excitement when Sub-Zero, Kenshi, and Scorpion show up, challenges he's never faced before. Yes, yes, yes! Ah, oh, this is the action I've been looking for! Ironically, this desire King Kano has will also give our heroes the chance to beat him and it will ultimately be his downfall. Okay enough simping for the scene, time to talk about some controversial points. I don't think I need to repeat myself, but here I go. I hate Kronika. I ranted on Kronika for 30 minutes about why she's the worst video game character ever. So why did I like this twist despite my hatred towards her? Actually, I think this is a pretty good topic to group with the next one. People have stated that the ending to this movie feels similar to how they did it in Battle of the Realms. Both come out of nowhere, and both feature elements people don't want to see. I don't want to see that shit! The major difference is, in Battle of the Realms, it feels completely phoned in. People came into this movie wanting to watch a karate tournament. tournament with cool characters fighting each other. They don't want to see a galactic dimension shifting Super Saiyan Kaiju fight. Sure, you could say that this was foreshadowed early on in the movie. You are the only one who can open the door to the last Komidogu. And if Shinnok gets them all, the one being will reappear. But that's not enough for such a behemoth of a climax. It's like if in the ending of the Avengers, after they defeat Loki, Thanos suddenly shows up, snaps away half the population, and they do the plot of Endgame within the last 10 minutes. No! In Snowblind, however, the movie was built on the foundation of this twist. Everything iffy about the worldview and characters of this movie are all solved with this one twist. The reaction I had when seeing this twist at first was shock, but then it was clarity. This is literally like Kano's arcade ending in MK11. That is, yeah, this whole movie is literally his arcade ending. Not to mention, the one being action scene was an utter dumpster fire, while the hourglass fight was one of the best and most creative fight in the series. To close my thoughts on Kronika, yes, I hate her, and I wish to never see anything related to her on my damn television screen ever again. But a wise man once told me, a bad idea can be done well. A bad idea can be done well. Mm -hmm. mm. Also, Kronika is fucking dead in this movie, so I ain't complaining about that. But if you still hate the hourglass and don't want it in this movie, then let me propose an alternative. That's say the movie ended when the trio defeat King Kano, and the explanation for why this all happened is because this is an alternate continuity, which kind of works as an explanation. But I still don't feel like it's enough. 
even if this is a what if story, it still takes place in a Mortal Kombat universe, the tournament still happened, and factions like the Lin Kui and Black Dragon still exist, I still think there's a lot of stuff you need to explain, where is Outworld, they seem to always be interested with Earthrealm, where did the revenants come from, why would Quan Chi, or Shinnok, or Scorpion, release them on Earth, and finally, where are Earth's mightiest heroes? Do you mean to tell me that Connor, who somehow became super OP, killed them all? Even if this is an alternate universe, I would still have these questions. And if you can solve all of these, by just saying, Connor wielded it that way, with Chronic as our glass, I would choose that. Though it does come with one inquiry, how the fuck did Kano beat Kronika? Some of it's best left unsaid because you want to draw your own conclusions. Because they don't explain too much, I think it kind of is advantageous for them. Because if they explain how Kano got the crown, or how like Kano survived in Scorpion's Revenge, or like how this all happened, we might complain more. But the fact that it's yeah. ambiguous, I think it might be a better thing. Because for this narrative, it doesn't matter how Kano got the crown. All, all that matters is he got it. Yes. So you can explain it if you want but you, you run the risk of making it really dumb, whereas the audience can fill in the blanks by helping come up with their own explanation. So I might think, well, maybe Kano did just steal the crown from someone. Maybe he beat up Kronika in a one-on-one -on -one fight. That is possible in MK11, so yeah, who knows? Because yeah. we can fill in the blanks ourselves. It avoids us feeling negative about whatever explanation they come up with. So it was quite smart to do that. And I have one last sort of criticism about this twist. If you never played through Mortal Kombat 11 story mode, you would probably be really confused. In fact, I wouldn't even blame you if you thought this was some bullshit they pulled out of their asses. However, I don't know a single person that watched this movie, and didn't go through the story mode of MK11. So I have no perspective of this issue. If any of you have funny stories of people you know that don't play MK, and how they reacted to this twist, tell me in the comments. I'm interested in knowing this, and that's mostly all I've got to say about the twist. Overall, it changed my perspective of how I viewed this whole entire movie, and I personally find that to be very impressive for a Mortal Kombat film. But enough about me, let's kill you! King Kano then shows Sub-Zero a glimpse of the next world he's gonna make, with Kenshi being killed, and Sub-Zero turning into his BDSM slave. Then King Kano uses the hourglass to Thanos snap Sub-Zero away. And luckily, Sub-Zero is able to stop him. They then start fighting on the background of Kronika stage. I never thought you could do that. That's... Fucking radical. This is probably the best fight in the movie. The creative way they use the spirals to fight is really fun. The only issue I have is a combination of 2D and 3D animation. Does feel a bit iffy in some shots. What's wrong with your face? King Kano has Sub-Zero pinned down. Oh. <laughs> Stop screaming! Stop screaming! Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? I like you. I do, I like you. Kneel oh. before me. And I'll set you up as oh. King. Antarctica? <laughs> I kneel before no man. Oh. He said the thing that whitewashed Art Lean said. That's so touching. Though, how did he hear him say that from miles away? Anyways, Sub-Zero destroys King Kano's sword arm and pose off his own. Oh! Everybody's losing their arms here. Oh my, there had to have been an easier way to do that. <laughs> well, he's trying to get an upgrade like this. Hey, you wanna see something cool? Okay, okay, that's cool. Make this canon. Netherrealm Studios. I want Lin Kui members cutting off their own limbs so they can have a rice armor. This is how I see Injustice Sub Zero from now on. Then Sub Zero gives King Kano the happy feet. Look at it, look at this. He takes his arm that's attached to his old <laughs> arm and uses his new arm to stab him. <laughs>
Say the line, Bart. The bollocks. Yeah! Oh, stage fatality. Stage fatality. Then the heroes meet up. Oh, Scott. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Forgot Scorpion came back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming each of their fights happened at the same time. Where's Kano? Lying around. <laughs> It's lying, ain't I? Then Sub Zero and Scorpion destroy the crown, which destroys the hourglass and everything around it. Then Qi Liang says goodbye to Kenshi. You and I can root out the revenants and we can. No. No? No. Because of you, I have some sense of honor again. Then work with me to help the people of the wasteland. No. No? Remember what I said about my power. No? I made a promise. And if I don't keep it, he will. His boyfriend. <laughs> what promise? What are you talking about? We can recreate the Lin Kuei. No. I don't understand. Because of you, I have some sense of honor again. What are you talking about? I can feel it. Even now. What? I made a promise. What promise? Remember what I said about my power. No. It can't be controlled. We can start over. No. I made a promise. What promise? And if I don't keep it, he will. Hey, hey, I'm here for my cameo. What? Work with me to help the people of the wasteland. What? Promise. I don't understand. What are you we talking can, about? Blind 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 blind. Blind. Stop asking questions. Every time you ask questions, it makes the scene go on longer. <laughs> <laughs> then Qi Liang goes to Netherrealm, and Kenshi walks towards the sunrise. Lion King! And that is the end of the movie. So, um, that ending kinda sucks. I know I said the twist was the most controversial part, but I think everybody unanimously hate this ending. And that's because, why didn't they use the hourglass? They are literally living in a hellhole, created by Connor. There are evidence roaming around. It's hard to grow crops. Innocent people have suffered and died. Why didn't they use the hourglass? Heck. Qi Liang saw a world where he saves his brother. Heck. Qi Liang was trying to use the hourglass during the King Kano fight. Protect Earthrealm, or there will be other threats. Hum. I wonder if there was an easy way to solve this. In the movie Justice League Dark Apocalypse War, spoilers obviously, the heroes are victorious. However, their battle has left Earth in a horrible state. How bad? We lost 31% of the Earth's molten core. The planet's rotation is compromised. My best estimate is another billion deaths before we can get anything under control. Provided we can. And many of their friends have died. So John Constantine asks the Flash to restart the universe. You know what you have to do, mate. Start again. Another flashpoint. The Flash doesn't want to do it, because any change in the past can result in a catastrophic future. Shifting everything just a tiny bit, but enough. Enough for events to happen slightly differently. But John tries to persuade him. Some of those changes may be shite, and we may make the same mistakes again. We'll be alongside better than what we got now. And so the Flash restarts the universe to try and make a better world. Why didn't they use the hourglass? I get that the implication is something along the lines of, we shouldn't mess with powers beyond our comprehension. But I really think you should have made an exception here mate. I do like the conversation between Kenshi and Qi Liang at the end. Qi Liang thanks Kenshi for making him realize the good that he can still do with his powers. To save the world. To save the ones he loves. But he made a promise, and now he must leave a scorpion. By the way, before somebody makes a one hour analysis video about what this supposed Z promise I was, made a promise. the answer is quite simple. When Sub-Zero used his storm of ice in the city, and killed everyone around him, he swore to himself that he will never use his powers again. Not just because of his own philosophy, but also because his cryomancy abilities are too powerful, and he will lose control. If I start fighting, I won't stop, and then the storm will return. So the promise he made, was actually to Scorpion. I have come, as promised. And the promise is along the lines of, if I ever use my abilities and lose control, then please come and solve my issue. Whether he wants him to cure him, or kill him, is up to interpretation. Is he going to another realm to get healed, or is he going there to die? That's for sure. He's going there to be there. Now, before we get into my final review, let me start by talking about what they can do for the next movie. 
for starters. We really can't tell whether this takes place in the same universe as Scorpion's Revenge and Battle of the Realms, or if this is an alternate universe. I personally believe in the former, because you can see elements taken from the previous films in Snowblind. The Liu Kang monument reads, Beloved Hero of the Realms, perhaps the realms this is referring to, were the ones he helped separate in the previous film. Shang Tsung being here, since he didn't die in the previous movie. Kano being more cybernized, because his face got messed up in the first movie. And the biggest evidence, Scorpion and Sub-Zero working together, because of the bond they had in the previous movie. Now if I were to predict the next Legends movie, I'd say it's going to be about the combat kids. Kenshi is going to look for new recruits to build the new Linkui. Find others, train them. So who better than some youngsters like the combat kids, especially since one of them will be Kenshi san Breaking news. Rick Morales has just announced the title of the next Mortal Kombat animated movie. It's going to be called Mortal Kombat Legends Cage Match, starring Joe McHale as Johnny Cage. No! You're in the cage with Johnny. No, God, please, no! This thing better not go straight to video. No! Toasty. No! Mouth to mouth. No! Oh, fine. If you idiots want to take advantage of this golden opportunity, then I will. He must be the hero. <gasps> he? Who is he? Yeah, you just got caged. Please, Elder Gods, no. I shall reserve my judgment until the movie is out so that still fits with my combat kid's idea. An older Johnny Cage can help guide the new Lin Kui, and Cassie Cage can be involved. What if I told you, other than cage match, that everything I said for the last two minutes was a lie? These were all my naive thoughts about what I think we can expect from the future of this franchise. But after looking into more articles, interviews, the commentary, the DVD extras, and asking Jeremy Adams himself, I have 99.9% .9 proof that Mortal Kombat's No Blind takes place in an alternate universe, and future Legends movies will too. What I'm about to share will make gaming journalists envy with green. So buckle up boys, this is going to be a bumpy ride. Let's begin at the origins. The creation of Snowblind, when the crew were hired to work on the Mortal Kombat animated films, they were contracted to make two movies, and only two. You said earlier that basically Battle of the Realms was supposed to be the end of the series, is that right? Yeah, we really, really did think that was it, we were going to get two movies and that's it. This is why Battle of the Realms feels very bloated, because they literally threw every idea they had into this movie. If I would say there was a weakness, it was like, oh, we put too much in there. Also, cutting 40 minutes out of it didn't help. We cut out like 40 minutes. The Temple of Elements was much bigger. Yeah. I mean, there was like all the elements. There's a whole scene where Johnny is like, I don't know if he's trying to find flowers or something. It was something really silly. <laughs> and Bill was like really funny about it. And they sneak out and they end up finding this clone farm. Oh. That, and, and there's this huge battle with Scorpion being chased with Ermac. You know, all that stuff was a little, little with longer. With Ermac and, too. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure, but it's been it's been so long. And Rick, Rick and I are so enthusiastic about stuff. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. And the next thing I know, I'm like, we've had to cut quite a bit. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> After the movies were out, it turns out the Legends movies did quite well financially. Those movies did really well in terms of sales and I think streaming. And Warner Brothers wanted a third movie, but they already threw all their ideas to Battle of the Realms. How can they continue the stories of these characters? Fortunately, Warner Brothers doesn't want that. I get this call from like the president of Warner Brothers Animation. They're like, hey, this did really well for us. We'd love to be able to do a couple more, but we want them to be totally different. We want them to be not in the same vein as the other two to be direct sequels right away. So Jeremy Adams sent them six scripts. One of them was Snowblind, which is the one they went on and did. Yeah, I sent them like six different ideas. And one of them was Snowblind. Snowblind was the one that we really got excited for. But here's the important part. Another one of these scripts 
was Cage Match. And one of them was the Johnny Cage. I will tell you that I wrote this script quite a while ago, so mm -hmm. I don't know what that means, but there you go. So no matter which one of these six scripts were chosen, wouldn't have mattered to the continuity of the past two films, perhaps. It's because they take place in an alternate universe. Alright enough theory crafting. Time to go straight to the source. What did Jeremy Adams say when asked about this? This movie a sequel for Battle of the Realms? It is a sequel, but only in an abstract way. Here's the real rub of it. Uh, wait. I'm trying to think. If I say this now, does this come back to haunt me in the future? You know? <laughs> uh, the real question is, is this a sequel or is this the original movie and Scorpion's Revenge is a sequel? That's the real question. The real question is, where is this take place? And when you talk about Chronica and stuff, it's like, well, it could come before those things. And that's the best way I can say it. And that's the kind of thing that I'm like, I hear that. And I'm like, how the heck am I supposed to comprehend this information? This right here was the moment that convinced me that Snowblind takes place in an alternate universe, which honestly amplifies the movie for me. Sure, some people might wish Snowblind was more connected with the previous two movies, but I think this makes it not limited to things that were set up from the last two films, such as anything related to the one being. Also, I don't like those characters, so I'm completely fine with abandoning them. I don't care what happens to the world! Johnny doesn't even seem like he's in the- <gasps> We don't even know who the character is. He's probably not even in this movie. <laughs> yeah, probably, actually. Johnny, Sonya, Liu Kang, I don't think they're even in this movie, actually. I like it already. <laughs> the only issue I have with this being an AU is that there is no explanation why Sub-Zero and Scorpion are working together. If this did take place after Battle of the Realms, I wouldn't mind. This literally came out of nowhere, but I'm kinda not mad at it. Here's the thing though, in Battle of the Realms, Sub-Zero and Scorpion became BFFs. So it's like, I don't think it's too unreasonable for him to like, be able to summon him. But now without that, having the most famous video game arch enemy working together, is kinda weird. The idea of more what if stories, makes me so excited for what's to come from the Legends franchise. When you play the game, whoever your favorite character is, everybody has a favorite character. But my feeling is, is like, you beat the game with Liu Kang, and it's like, okay, that's the ending. Is that the real ending? I guess, that, what's the real ending? What's the real character ending? What's the lore version of it? And my answer to that is all of them. You know, if you, you, you beat it with your character, that's the ending. It's a multiverse. I mean, everybody's doing multiverses right now. This has been a multiverse forever. The idea being that, like, we're going to take one of those endings and set it in that ending, to me, was, like, I, I thought that's a good idea to sort of open it up and say, like, you can, you can do whatever you want in this world. Like, it's such a multiverse. Yeah. It's shifted and changed and expanded so much now that and now they're starting to really get into the smaller characters and yeah. different storylines all that great material was just sitting there for us to address in our movie you know this is just the icing on the cake of what happened in battle of the realms no i want i no i so to, to me i wanted to open the door for an endless world of possibilities mm -hmm. around mortal kombat in my head personally i don't want mortal kombat to ever be like it has to be this certain way right. there are certain things that are essential ingredients to it but story-wise it doesn't always have to be tied to the mm -hmm. tournament it doesn't always have to be about the realms being conquered by right. shao Kahn or whatever like you can focus in on a on a portion of it and tell sub zero story or tell Kenshi's story without it being so grandiose you know and then going forward if we do more of these there's an open canvas to paint awesome. with mortal kombat we are dealing with some sort of multiversal yeah decision. so they need to have like right. a crisis on mortal kombat earth is what i'm saying <laughs> so we just consolidate to a one world scenario if we can get kenshi as a main character just imagine what plots we can get from the arcade endings. A movie about the great Kung Leo, someone else defeating Blaze, weird but awesome team-ups. More story in lore. Probably the idea I would want to see the most is a movie about Adenia. You know what I think they will go next? I think it will be Katana and it will be about Adenia. Because that's a lot of potential be to cool. be. I would be totally yeah. down. Rather than focusing on a specific character that you'd like to bring to the Legends universe, how about any focus on any specific realms? I mean, I've said Adenia, right? Like, that's been one, the history of that, the kind of, like, 
Game of Thrones of that would be super cool. All these ideas is getting me way more excited than whatever NetherRealm Studios next plot will be. Now with all this new info, let me try one more time to predict what cage match will be. I believe it's going to take place in the Scorpion's Revenge slash Battle of the Realms universe because they are getting Joe McHale back as Johnny. I know I just said future Legends movies are going to take place in alternate universes, but that doesn't mean they can't come back to one they've already made. Heck, Snowblind left a lot for a potential continuation for that universe. What's cool about Kenshi and where his arc ends, it definitely feels like the prologue. He's become the master, and now he's heading off to do justice in the world. And I love where we leave him because it leaves a door open to take any direction you want. We could follow him from this movie. We could follow his adventures in this world if they ever said, hey, we want you to follow. If there was ever a demand for something like that, yeah. yeah. So my big brain prediction is that this is going to be a movie within a movie. Johnny is going to make his own Mortal Kombat movie, or it'll be a documentary about the first two tournaments. Basically, this is the dream movie the fourth snake has always wanted. One is that you make like what Johnny Cage's Mortal Kombat movie is. You make that. And so it's like his alternate take oh, that'd be on awesome, these dude. events. Ah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Another one he starts as like a documentary about his career, how, how the, like the ups and downs and how he it all went to shit and then brought it back with this Mortal Kombat thing. Mm -hmm, that's really good. That sounds then, so then, fun. And perhaps you end on like a, a bit of a tragic note that it's after the invasion, Johnny has died and that's when the <laughs> movie got made. Oh my goodness. Or it could just be a Deadpool movie. It's going to be the hero. Yeah, it's, pure, it's, unadulterated awesomeness. It's the movie that probably never should have been made. <laughs> and I could tease that it's not as serious. Obviously, because the minute you have Joel McHale involved as Johnny Cage, it's going to be a little more lighthearted in a lot of ways. I think we should all be prepared for something that's just peculiar. <laughs> what do you think you think it is? It's absolutely not that. It is so ridiculous that we were allowed to do it. I'm still convinced they're going to stop us. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can tell you. I imagine it's going to be an hour and a half of Johnny Cage getting hit in the balls. And, that's... <laughs> and I will add that I'm pretty sure it won't be about Cassie Cage or the Combat Kids. Because Jeremy Adams said this when asked about the Combat Kids. How do you feel about the new Age of Heroes slash Combat Kids? I like any sort of progression, but... Oh, no, it's great. I get it. You're progressing the universe and stuff. But like for me, I still feel there's so much to tell with the current traditional slate of characters. To wrap this part up, I'm going to talk about Reptile one last time. Jeremy Adams stated once that he doesn't believe that the Saurian and Tarkatin in Scorpion's Revenge was Reptile and Baraka, despite numerous evidence suggesting otherwise. In fact, just recently, I found out the HBO Max subtitles call them Baraka and Reptile. Oh! But whatever, I'm still hyped that we might see the real Reptile in the future. But actually, now that the Legends team is moving more towards alternate universe stories, I can confidently say, I am done hoping for the real reptile, because even if reptile shows up in a future movie, it's most likely going to be one from an alternate universe, and not from the Scorpion's Revenge universe, so I am officially done with this wild goose chase. I'm contempt with the lizard dude from Scorpion's Revenge being reptile, and I'm sure 99.9% .9 of people thought that was reptile too. Hopefully, if we see a new reptile. He can look on par with your first masterpiece. Don't fuck this up art department team. Now onto my final review. Let me start by talking about some negatives. I really think they could have handled Shang Tsung a bit better. Kenshi and Shang Tsung's rivalry was the biggest thing people were looking forward to. And while the setup was there, the payoff wasn't. I will teach you to use your senses. So I can find Shang Tsung. Sorry. Tremor becomes Kenshi's arch nemesis in this. Some of the dialogue is pretty cringy. Like survival. Where are you going? Inside. <laughs> Where else can I go here? It's very apparent that the art style in this movie is very different from the previous two. They go with a more sketch-like, unrefined style, with oil-painted backgrounds, perhaps to fit with the style of the wastelands. With all this being said, I do think Scorpion's Revenge's art style looks better, and Snowblind's art style could be attributed to budgeting reasons. Though, Jeremy Adams said, 
Okay, so next question comes from Sonic Ha XD. Hey, Mr. Adams, the art style in the movie is really different from the previous two. Yeah. What's the reason for that? That was a request. Oh, there really? was a request from higher up that they wanted it to be different in design and story. Whatever the case, I do appreciate the effort of a different art style, despite it not being better than its predecessor. I like the new designs they gave to most of the characters in this movie, but I must say, I am not vibing with King Kano's new look. The ginger hair is just not doing it for me. I also wish he took off his coat in the final battle, so then we get to see more of his cybernized body. And the worst thing about this movie, is actually not the ending. That does suck too. My biggest issue, is the first 50 minutes of the movie. There is a statement floating around, that says, this is the most boring Mortal Kombat film out there. And honestly, I do agree with this. The movie does take its time building up the world and characters, but it does it so much to a fault. The second act of the movie is literally a training montage with two people chatting for the most part. Now I'm sure some of you are saying, But Sadik, there were action scenes in the first 50 minutes of the movie. Yes, but even those are more as evident small scaled compared to some of the previous epic fight scenes we had. Except for the Shang Tsung fight, that was good. I personally don't find the slower paced story to be that bad. I like to point out bad writing, story inconsistencies, and mistakes in general. But if nothing is really happening, I see that as a positive. And that's kind of how I view the first 50 minutes of the movie. Nothing really bad, but nothing really great either. Just solid, decent, mid. Honestly, if it weren't for the third act of the movie, this might have been the most forgettable Mortal Kombat feature. But luckily, the third act carries this entire film. Now on to the positives. The action is still superb, and they really get creative with some of these fights. Kenshi's Jedi techniques, the interesting ways Sub-Zero uses his cryomancy, Tremor's magma moves. I especially appreciate the 360 shots they attempt. We wanted to still be kinetic in our use of the camera during those sequences. Those are tricky camera moves to pull off in traditional animation. A lot of times, people shy away from stuff like that, but to me, I'm just like, let's go for it. There are some pretty weird parts if you watch it in 0.25 speed, but overall, it's excellently gruesome. Speaking of gore, this is probably the bloodiest Mortal Kombat film out there. I had to double up the KK in a wheelchair sensor bars. They took the gore of the first 10 minutes of Scorpion's Revenge, and plastered it all over Snowblind. Shang Tsung's execution might be the most brutal and best fatality in this series. I've always wanted to see fighters lose their limbs, yet keep on fighting, and we get plenty of those here. The voice acting is great, Manny Jacinto does a great job, for the cocky and young nature of Kenshi, but also transitions well into the second half, where he's more serious and humble. Scorpion from Mortal Kombat 11 was great as old man Qi Liang, and Ferrama from Lord of the Rings did a great job voicing the big bad King Kono. He was probably channeling his father's hatred in the booth. Abandon your booth! Please pay for your lies! You're the same. The fan service was great. I like seeing the side characters showcase their moves before they get killed off. It doesn't have as many main characters in it, but we still wanted to set it firmly within the Mortal Kombat universe and give the fans the ability to see some of the smaller characters represented in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. Sure, there were some that got shafted. But I do think it's better handled than what they do in Battle of the Realms. I might be biased, because Farah got in so many stabs onto Sub-Zero. And my favorite thing about this movie, is King Kano. Uh. If I had a nickel every time I see modern Mortal Kombat movies, make Kano the best part, I'd have two nickels. That's not a lot, but it's funny that it happened twice. I always appreciate when villains are more than just, I wanna rule the world cause I'm evil. And the fact that King Kano has godlike powers, yet he chooses to be mortal, because that way, the challenge would be more fun, is psychotically interesting. King Kano isn't just a good villain, he might just be my favorite Mortal Kombat villain. <laughs> oh goodness I'm funny. To end off this review, let me bring back the three main points as to why I disliked the previous films. 
I don't like the rules of the first tournament, and I find the second one to just be bad. I don't like the characters in the first, and they quadruple them for the sequel. I don't like how they handled the two plots in Scorpion's Revenge, and it's even more messy in Battle of the Realms. After seeing these two films, I always wanted to see the Legends crew try something more small scaled, because I don't think they do a good job when they tackle so many characters and so many plots in one movie. I want quality over quantity, and that's what Snowblind is. It's just two main characters, and one simple plot to follow, and I much prefer the story to be told this way. My big feeling on, on this film after we finished 2, or while we were working on 2 and starting to conceive this, was that I wanted it to get smaller. Okay. Because 2 was so big and so yeah. ridiculous. There's so many characters, and we tried to fit as many in as we could. Yeah. Because of that, you can't really drill down into anything like real, you know? To me, even as we were in the midst of making that, I was like, if we do another one, we're going small with <laughs> it, you know, and, and, and scaling it down. This is the problem I got into with Battle of the Realms. I'm like, here's 12 stories I'm going to cram into 79 minutes. And, uh, and none of that works out well. So at least we learned the lesson, right? <laughs> it's about Kenshi and it's about Sub-Zero and that's about it. You tell their story. I just wanted to do something simpler. I always, in my reviews, just keep saying, you guys don't do good subplots. Just try to focus on one plot instead. Try to focus on individual characters. And that's what this movie is. And I'm touched. I feel like they listened to me and I'm shedding a tear. The journey and arcs these characters go through is pretty great. Kenshi starts off as a snarky brat who likes to fight people, because to him, being the strongest is honor. I was a great warrior. No one could beat me, no one. Despite the horrors of the world, I had that. And when he loses that, he has nothing. But Qi Liang saves him. He teaches him that there is more to life than honor. There is more to life than honor. Like what? Like living like survival. Qi Liang believes that by not fighting, by doing nothing, less people will die around him. Death begets death, and the cycle of violence continues. If kneeling spares those around me, I'd live on my knees. But later on, Kenshi wants to save the people being oppressed by the black dragon, and Qi doesn't. Being selfish is better than being dead. You go down there, and you die. I taught you so you could live. But Qi Liang unintentionally contradicts this because he saved Kenshi. You taught me to help those in need. No, that's not what- Of course you did. Where would I be if you didn't pick me up? If you didn't train me? So from this point on, Kenshi's arc is finished. He's gone from being just the wandering samurai that's trying to prove himself to being the guy that wants to go out there and help. Your pride will be your downfall. Doing what's right isn't pride, it's honor. And even if you've lost yours, I won't lose mine. And now it's Qi Liang's turn to grow as a character. I am surprised that at the end it kind of turns into more of a... Qi Liang story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Qi Liang was the one who remembered to do the right thing. I heard some people saying they wished Kenshi fought King Kano at the end. But I think it's the perfect conclusion for Qi Liang to fight King Kano, because in a way, they are the exact opposite of each other. Kano is the worst version of Kenshi. I know, I know that sounds weird. Let me explain. In the beginning, all Kenshi wanted to do is fight. It didn't matter that the world was in a horrible state. It didn't matter that the people around him were suffering. All that matters is the satisfaction of beating every opponent he crossed. Despite the horrors of the world, I had that. Just like King Kano, King Kano made this world just for his own amusement. Just so he can find people to fight for his own satisfaction. The only person in this universe that Kano cares about is himself. Huai Liang taught Kenshi to be a better person. And King Kano is standing on the exact opposite of the spectrum to Qi Liang. Ultimately, Qi Liang isn't just fighting King Kano to save the world. He's also trying to redeem himself for being selfish and doing nothing all these years. Hey, what made you take up your snowballs Ball. and give it a go? I finally realized there's no honor in standing by while the world is destroyed around you. <gasps> Scott Aaron, the power of love. I prefer made in my image. Scott Aaron, the power of self-respect. The ultimate message of this movie is selfish versus selfless.
So you see, I definitely prefer character development like this, and I feel like by having a simpler and smaller script, you can tell a more effective story. I've always seen potential for the Legend series. Even if I don't like the changes they make to the original source material, I still feel impressed with how crazy they are willing to go. So when the movie itself has nothing based off of it, I feel like this is where the Legends crew can really shine. And I am very happy to finally have a movie in the Legend series that I can proudly say. I liked it. Oh my god. They did it. They pulled through. But the fact that you're able to do an MK story where I can say it's somewhat decent, like that's amazing to me. They made a movie. It's not a steaming pile of fucking shit. Like nowadays, it's a miracle if an MK story can actually be somewhat decent. I found the gold at the end of the rainbow. Oh, maybe it's not gold, maybe it's bronze or something, but they made a movie. It's not shit. I feel like the ending of Silver Lining Playbook, where the main characters were like doing the dance, and the judges give them a 5 out of 10, and they just start swoo, celebrating and screaming, yeah, 5 out of 10, while the judges would be like, What's so, what's so special about that? <laughs> he did it! He fucking did it! It's not shit! The movie feels like a fan fiction, in the best way possible. And if we can get more of these fun fan fictions, I'm looking very forward to seeing where this franchise is heading. Even for Cage Match, it gets worse each film. What in the hell? I'm gonna be sick. You can walk up to my face, and say, you like Scorpion's Revenge more. You can even say you didn't like this film. But to say this is worse than Battle of the Realms? Seriously? Seriously? Really? Really? You really mean to tell me that you think Snowblind is worse than constant animation mistakes? Over 20 lackluster characters. Johnny Cage 1 vs 1 fights that last around 10 seconds. And so Liu Kang having Super Saiyan godlike powers, but also just being a nobody. Two plots that cut in between each other 14 times within 30 minutes. I've counted. Ha, huh, I'm sure you have. Everything. Everything about the one being ending. You think this is better than Snowblind? Well. You know what they say. How did the Americans say? Just because a man lacks the use of his eyes, doesn't mean he lacks vision. Oh, I get it. Because I'm blind. <laughs> it's blind, man. Hey guys, what is up? Sonic XD here, and thank you all so much for watching this video. Or listening because I need a, another stupid blind joke for this video. <laughs> Originally, I was planning for this to be a bit, of a, a bit of a smaller video since I don't really think too much happens in Snowblind. And now this is the longest sucks video I have ever made. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I actually cut out about like 10 to 20 minutes of content out of my original script just because I thought it was going on for way too long. But overall, I personally do think a lot of stuff in this video or the length of it is justified. I do try to make it as entertaining as possible and I do hope you guys enjoy the most effort I put into a sucks video but only because of the length of the video for the most part. <laughs> and while this is the longest sucks video I've made it is also the biggest collab video I have ever made on this channel. There are so many people who helped me out uh, behind the scenes or I got commissions from and I'm just gonna thank as many as I can right here right now. So first off I'd like to thank my brother Saya. Thank you so much for being the first person to watch the movie with me and recording our reaction together. If it weren't for you watching the first movie with me I would not have fallen this deep into uh, my love and affection with the Legends series. Now, I'm not too sure if that's a compliment or not, but just just take it anyways. <laughs> and next up, I'd like to thank the Force Snake and True Underdog. Thank you for, well, first off, forming the Combat Kings so that we could watch the movie together. I appreciate the reactions you guys had because every time I'm like saying, oh, how the audience might feel about this scene or something like that, you guys just mwah, perfectly convey that with your reactions. And, uh, <laughs> and thank you, Snake, for the green screen cameos again in this video. You would never escape me. Next up, I'd like to thank the Realm cast. Thank you so much for interviewing uh, Jeremy Adams. From all the interviews and behind the scenes clips that I could find, literally the interview that you guys did gave me the most additional info that I needed for this video. Thank you Phantom and Yanni for doing the interviews. 
And uh, by the time this video is out, I believe I actually recorded a Realmcast episode on their channel. So if you guys want to just see us chatting over there, then I'm pretty sure the episode should be out a couple days like before this video is out. Uh, I, I, I'm sure we had a great time. I'm sure we had plenty of fun chatting about stuff. <laughs> and next up, I'd like to thank the people who worked on this movie, uh, Jeremy Adams and Rick Morales. Thank you so much for all the interviews that you've done, whether it be on the Realmcast or at the NYCC convention or in your commentary, because there were so many questions that I had about this movie and you guys pretty much answered all of them and i'm really appreciative of that especially you mr jeremy adams thank you so much for doing the live stream uh, q a and literally answering my questions that i was wondering about i think it's just totally awesome that i got to get a chance to ask you those questions and uh for the very very small off chance any of the people who worked on this movie are actually watching this video um hi uh <laughs> No, no hard feelings. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly doing this for entertainment purposes, and I, I know I made like two very long videos um, talking your last two movies, but uh, just, just take it, take it as a critique from a random YouTuber, um, and I, and I really did like Snowblind, so um, yeah. <laughs> And finally, I also like to thank Pyro Chomper, my man. Thank you so much for coming in clutch with the commentary. Uh, literally, it took him months to f just get the Blu-ray DVD because they weren't sending it to his country until like like this year, and he barely sent me the footage so that I could barely fit it into this video. And just thank you so much for all that hard work, Pyro Chomper. I I truly truly appreciate that. Now I like to thank a lot of artists who helped me out in the video because I have a ton of commissions that I used in this video. So first off, I'd like to thank BK Hat. Thank you so much again for drawing the amazing commissions in my video. And I would even say that this is probably the most complicated drawings that she's done for my video, mainly because I asked for the reptile reference sheet. That was just basically something I wanted for myself as like a personal project. And she delivered all that, plus the meme images for the video. And this definitely took a lot of time for her. And I really appreciate the art that she gave. Also, I'd like to mention that I definitely held back and did not commission a sexy reptile in this video because because the opportunity needed to go to sexy quiet yang because it actually makes sense for that in the video so i, I better not hear any of you saying like oh you just oh you just commissioned him because you're sick fetish no 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 you see sexy quiet yang okay so i'm doing it for the video okay okay I mean, yeah, I did get the naked T-pose and but, that, but that, that, that's, that's beside the point. And next up, I'd like to thank Kay's. So this is a bit of a funny story. Kay on Twitter was opening their commissions and because they wanted to get the uh, Christmas edition uh, Black Knight from the Fire Emblem gacha game. And so I didn't really think too much about it. I basically just commissioned them because I wanted to donate some money for them basically. And also they've been helping me with moderating and, and, and whatnot. So I'm just like, ah, whatever, take take my money. I'm, I'm just basically using this as a donation. And I must say, I'm very, very happy and impressed with the Johnny Cage pointing me. I, I think this looks basically just like a Legends version of Johnny Cage and I'm very happy with this. Thank you so much for the uh, amazing uh, commission K and I hope you're enjoying your Christmas Black Knight. <laughs> and next up I got a very cool story that I've got. So one day I was browsing through my own Discord server and Okamaka came on and posted 3D models of Reptile. And not just any 3D model of Reptile, but he made a Scorpion's Revenge version of Reptile. And I was completely blown away. I was like, whoa, that is so cool. I instantly slid into his DMs and was like, yo, I need to commission something from you, bro. You made you made such a cool model, like I had to. So that's why you saw Katamara Dancing uh, Reptile, which was not planned in the script. I just added that in because I just saw this friggin' amazing model. So uh, thanks for the dance there. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna show for a bit for this model because uh, Okamika has released this model. You can download it and you can use it to pose or anime however you want. You can you can use this model into VR chat too. And Okamika was very nice to me and he actually gave me the model. So I had to of course use it to do my own posing of course, which you can see right here. I just fiddled around with it. You can also change his skin from a more cartoonish looking to a more realistic looking scales. And uh, there's also some different costumes that you can turn on and off and whatnot. It's awesome. And I'm probably definitely going to commission more from him in the future. Uh, thanks again for the dance and literally thanks for just creating this model, creating this specimen of perfection. <laughs> 
And finally, this has been going on for way, way, way too long, so I have to cut it short. But there's still a lot of other people that I would think. I'll just try to put as many as I can on the screen. Uh, thank you all so much for either helping me out or allowing me to use your artwork in this video. And one last thing I'd like to mention, that Kenshi art in the thumbnail and in the video was drawn by yours truly. Yes, I did that myself and I'm very happy with how it came out. And I also did the uh, new version of the Butt Sex Scorpion and uh, Sub-Zero. So there's also that. <laughs> so what can you expect in the future after this? Well, hopefully next week I'll be able to upload the reaction video of me and my brother watching this uh, movie for the first time. I didn't use exactly everything that we had as a reaction in the video, so there might be some more funny stuff that we, we say or whatnot, and hopefully that'll be entertaining. And then after that, I'm going to work on the Mortal Kombat 9 sucks video. Yeah, that one's a, this one's been a one that people have been wishing for for a very long time. This was supposed to be the newest video that I make, however, because Snowblind came out, so I instead had to go with that because that's the newer content. But yeah, now that I'm done with the Snowblind video, I can just focus on the MK9 video, which I have a ton planned and I'm very excited to get into it. Hopefully it won't take me half a year. <laughs> Or, and lastly, I'd like to mention some uh, other videos that I've worked on in the past because if you guys still want to watch some more stuff from me, I actually uploaded a lot of videos around October of last year, uh, but they did not do very well. So I'd like to take just a little bit of time here just to like kind of show for them a bit. So I made a video asking my comment section uh, what they would like me to do or make as a video idea. Make a video with your figures or watch uh, Mortal Kombat Legacy and stuff like that. And then I, you guys also asked me some questions and I do some Q&As and that. And that was a lot of fun to make. And I, I think you guys would like it if you want to see some more Mortal Kombat stuff from me. I did a Scorpion's Revenge debate with Rusk Poet and I edited a one hour highlight version of that live stream. And uh, if you guys want to hear just more stuff about Scorpion's Revenge, if, if you're interested, uh, that exists. And finally, I already mentioned this once, the Poker Skit compilation video that I made. It has a 15 minute of extra Poker Skit content in that video. Like 15 minutes of the Poker Skit, which is pretty much my higher budget like stuff that I do in my sucks video, but 15 minutes of it. I, I say that, but there's still stick figures, but, but still that really took me like a ton of time to make. And I really would appreciate it if you guys can go check that out. And last thing I'd like to promote here is the Combat Kings podcast, where True Underdog, me, and the Four Snake get together and chat about a bunch of random stuff. We try to keep it with the MK topics, but uh, it does go um, off the rails for the most part. I always <laughs> put it that way. Uh, we've been staying pretty consistent on it. So uh, if you guys want to just watch us ramble in a podcast, then there is that. Yeah, I guess that's all I've got to say. If you guys actually listened through this whole entire conversation, uh, thank you so much. I love you so much for listening to all this rambling. Uh, <laughs> I hope you guys have a lovely day, and I hope you guys will enjoy the after credit scene that's coming up. So, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye! They grow up so fast. Indeed. Well, not so fast to the point where Tor dies and Farrah turns into a buff lady. Farrah Tor, send their regards. Let's see. Oh, cool. Aurora Flash.